Um, so my name's Ingvil Herfindahl. I'm right now the LSTA grant coordinator for CELCO working with the Collection HQ project. I'm also transferring hats because I was just hired as the Dodge Center library director. So for about a month, I'm going to be both. Um, and we're going to do a quick panel discussion with some of the pilot libraries uh, that have been working with Collection HQ. We've got Monica Erickson from Chatfield, James Hill from Zambroda, and Bonnie Kruger from Owatonna. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick overview of Collection HQ. Um, it's part of an LSDA grant that was written um, in 2014 for uh, data-driven collection management. Uh, with the budgets decreasing in everybody's library and demands on staff time increasing, the goal of this grant was to assist public libraries with collection development. Uh, we wanted to see if technologies would allow libraries to streamline acquisition and weeding processes, customize their collection to actual patron demand, and use collection and circulation data instead of um, anecdotes to do their purchasing and weeding, uh, and basically do more with less. So Selco offered a free workshop back in September uh, led by Peggy Johnson from the University of Minnesota covering the basics of collection development and its importance uh, that all the libraries in the region were invited to and I know some of you participated in that. Uh, also with proceeds from the grant we purchased the software or actually subscription to Collection HQ, a software program that said that they were going to deliver data-driven advice on collection development. We selected um, numerous pilot libraries. Some of it had to change halfway through due to um, staff time, health problems. Um, but right now, these are the pilot libraries that we've been working with. And three of them are here to talk about it today. OK, so what is Collection HQ? So Collection HQ is internet-based software that takes data from our ILS and analyzes it to allow libraries to manage their collections more efficiently. And once a month, Selco sends data from our ILS to Collection HQ, and Collection HQ then takes that data and provides a variety of reports. Let's see. Oh, now I get to switch. Okay, so I'm going to show a couple quick reports that we've been working with. Collection HQ runs a number of reports, some of which we can use and some <laughs> of which we can't because we don't have branches. So one of the reports that we used was called Dead Items. And that shows items that have been on your shelf sitting there with nobody checking them out. You can change how long that is from, you know, 60 days in a large metropolitan library maybe to, say, three or four years. So we're going to look at Chatfield's um, adult books. Everything in Collection HQ is broken down into fiction, nonfiction, nonbook, and ebook. And then each of those is broken down into the audience um, of adult, juvenile, and teen. So let's look. And it's very pretty and user friendly. So this comes up in a sorted list of things that have not checked out in, I think, what do we have, Monica? Four, three or four years for I your dead items. I don't remember. We <laughs> set it back and we haven't touched it for a while. So this pulls up. We've got the author, the title, ISBN, barcode, when it was added, when it was last used, what collection code it is, publication date, call number, how many times it's searched, and what it is. Um, we can print this out and what some of our libraries found very useful was you can print it out and it will display 
the barcode so you can scan it right from your printout. Um, and this will help you to remove things that are in your system that are not in demand by your patrons. Another report that we ask the libraries to run is called a grubby items, which is things that are dirty, things that have checked out a lot. So we're going to look at nonfiction this time. We'll look at, and again, there's lots of things you can choose. We're going to do juvenile nonfiction. We'll see what shows up. So this report will show things that have cirqued a lot and might be in need of replacement or might start to look ratty and you need to take it out or just take a look at it. Or if it's a DVD, it might need to be cleaned. So 10 Terrible Dinosaurs has cirqued 150 times. Very popular. Maybe the corners are starting to tear. Maybe you want to replace that item. And once again, these reports refresh. It's not live. It refreshes once a month. Um, now I'm going to skip over to purchasing. We'll do fiction again. Um, this is called collection demand. Popular authors. So we're going to see what's popular in chat field among teens. And this shows here are the most popular authors in your particular library. And if we sort, and I'm sorry if I'm going fast. I know we're running low on time. Um, so this says Ted Decker's books in the YA section. Um, there are six items in chat field. At any given time, None of them were on the shelf. Um, maybe you want to buy two more. And then you could look and see, here are the titles that I own and the most popular ones. And the nice thing about Collection HQ is the back button works, unlike Re Web Reporter. Um, and again, you can look down the list and discover who's popular, and based on um, what's in your library, what you might look at adding. I'm just going to show one last report, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel, and that's the Promote, which is a good marketing tool. It's uh, top charts. And I know Owatonna does a great job of putting this in the newspaper, Facebook, everywhere. Um, and this can tell you either the top authors or the top titles over the last month in your library. So let's look actually at non-book this time. We're going to look at the top titles at Chatfield. This time we're going to specify a collection code. We're only going to look at adult, not adult DVDs, but not kids okay. DVDs. Um, and this you can say how many you want. So we're just going to do the top 10. So the giver, the maze runner, best exotic marigold hotel, each were checked out four times. We're missing a data set here. So we're still looking at March's numbers. But this is then something you can put out to your community and said, here's what's popular at our library. OK. I'm sorry if I went fast through that. But I'm going to leave it up to our panelists to tell us a little more. Mm, not that one. That one. Nope. OK. Sorry. Okay, so how have you guys been using Collection HQ at your library? Who would like to start? Okay. Um, well, the top charts where we, we were just looking at, we've, we've used that quite a bit. Um, it, just a couple of instances where it came in really handy. Um, 
For instance, I was surprised when I had done a top titles, adults, and found that um, a series of Christian books by a new author that we hadn't gotten before came up, and that helped me decide, well, I should probably buy more by this author because she's going over well. Um, and then just, just yesterday, I was looking, and um, I had been working on cleaning. If, if you have any of the Outlander CDs and audios, I had just one book is like 25 CDs and I was cleaning and cleaning and then trying them and it's like okay four of them are bad so far I need to decide whether I'm going to replace this or not and I ran the top titles list uh, of the adult and the um, is it Diana Gabaldon or Gal Gabaldon anyway she was on top so it's like ah uh, yeah I think I'm probably going to have to replace this so um, that was just a couple of examples where that's come in really handy. Um, and then I just wanted to declare when she showed, since it was my titles, and, <laughs> and, and she had sorted on that one column and then it all came up red, you need more of these, there, you can also sort it to show we're, we're doing really well. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and you can see all those, so you can, there's a lot of flexibility in getting your report to show you exactly what you want to see so that you're not sorting through all of it. Um, that's one of the things I really liked about about them is that once you learn how to do it, you can do it's so you can manipulate so many things to show exactly what you're looking for without having to go search it. And in those little blank boxes at the top of each column, you could even type in a title or an author, and it'll bring you right to that. Um, and then uh, the ISBNs and the barcode numbers, they're live. So if you click them. Um, it either, I, I think I saw it two different ways. Does it ever take you right to your two? Yeah, and of course I'm looking it'll, it'll take you either to more information about that title, your particular holding. Like I was unclear on one that I was looking at yesterday when I was cramming for this, um, as to whether it meant that this book was missing or um, long overdue. It was a long overdue list. And I was able to click on it, and it brought me right to the item to tell me uh, it's been marked missing. Yeah, you can see they're kind of in blue. And it did. It went right so to that the catalog. From the ISBN. Which is so cool, because then you don't have to write it down and go back and look and see what exactly am I seeing here. Now, I'll let somebody else talk because I could go on and on. <laughs> so in Zabrota, we've been using it in a number of different ways. The weeding aspect of it is probably the most um, obvious, and, and we have used it particularly to help inform our nonfiction weeding. But the other value in this particular software is it informs your collection development. So one way in which we've been utilizing it is to look at some of the reports that show you areas in which you're underdeveloped or overdeveloped in terms of what you've been purchasing. So it kind of has this metric where it looks at the number of books, let's say, you have in your juvenile nonfiction and how often they circulate versus um, the demand on them. So, so we've basically then gone through and talked a little more philosophically, well, this you know, area, we've got a ton of e-books in our children's section and they're checking out, but we have so many that they're not all getting checked out. So that was considered an overstocked area. So my children's library and I had a discussion about reining in some of that collection development piece and focusing in some of the areas that were circling out a lot that we uh, didn't have as much purchasing in. So that's, I guess, how we've been using it. And at Oatana, we're also just using um, grubby items. Um, I use that if I have an area that's all the ones the pages are saying I can't get anything more in that area and I don't have time to do the um, the other list I, I do that to grab the go for the, the grubby <laughs> and it's amazing the first few times you do it even though you're looking at these books are highly circled you have them in your hand when they're checking in checking out how many are missed until you actually open them and see what they look like too. Um, it's not just the outside always of the books. And we don't take the time to open every book when it comes back to, to check for that. So that's been helpful. Um, 
we, as, as Ingold mentioned, we do use the top author lists and title lists, and it's um, published and out there. And of course, then when they come in and ask for them, it's like, well, that's our top ones. They're checked out. Would you like to be on the wait list? So I don't know why we do that. Why don't we promote the next <laughs> 50 down or whatever? But it's there. Um, and then as far as the, um, the CERC report or the, the ones that haven't been going out, that's eye-opening. Um, and when you go to remove them, I have a, a big conscience thing to deal with. Well, any one of us do. Um, oh, I remember buying that. <laughs> or, um, well, why isn't it going out? Uh, but then you look and there's you know all these items packed in, like you mentioned, with our e-books are overstocked too. And it's like, okay, this is a starting point. Just because it's on the list doesn't mean you have to pull it, you know, if you have certain re reasons to keep it. But there is a lot of stuff in there. If it's not going out, get rid of it. Uh, make room for new. Uh, whether you can afford it or not, it does seem, if you have open more opening on the shelves, people are more likely to look through them than when they're jam-packed and you can't scoot anymore in. When I, ran, when I ran that report and found those dearly beloved books, I just sat several of them up on, you know, face forward on the, and they went out the same day. <laughs> so it's like, sometimes it's a, a good tool as in, oh, maybe this just needs to be um, featured for a while so we can keep it. I've done that too, and then they've sat there still. So yeah, it's like, yep. then you know, it's okay. time to cut the, <laughs> It's cut not the dear, and, dear and dear to anyone else's heart. So um, unfortunately, we aren't using the acquisitions part like we should at this point. Okay, so this is similar question, but what features are the most useful to you? Um, well, like I, I guess I skipped ahead. Like I mentioned before, the, the ability to manipulate the data so well in the reports is extremely useful. Um, I also like that you have so many different options for exporting the results when you do run one. You know, sometimes I want an Excel, sometimes I want a PDF, and other times I just want to hit print and print it. Um, but the PDF works pretty nicely. And um, now that I've learned more about how to sort it, well, it's still in the report, I don't use Excel so much because I can get it just how I want it, almost easier in that report, and then go to the PDF. Um, printing the barcodes, I thought that was cool. Um, I had a volunteer work on, yes, we still had video cassettes, um, ran a report on dead items for that, and she was a volunteer, and all of our staff computers were in use. But I could run that out, uh, have her go get them, pack them up in a box and seal it, ready to go away. And then later on, she could, when there was a computer open, she could just take that report and scan the barcodes and remove them from the system. So that was really nice. Um, I also really like that when you're in a report, especially when it's new, and you're like, what the heck is this telling me? I don't even understand what this means. There's always a question mark up in the corner that you can click on that will tell you what this is, what this report is um, doing. I mean, sometimes I have to read three or four times, what is it doing now? But it, you know, it's, it's nice to have that help readily available there. Um, and also there's a academy part of the software that you can go to and you can watch webinars on all kinds of different topics and they're always adding new ones. Um, and half the time I couldn't make it when they were live, but they always tape them so I could go and do it when I did have time or if I had a special interest in something then. Um, you can set your own targets, like she asked me what our target, and you know, that's also one of the cons is that was really overwhelming for me and Ingbill was nice enough to, uh, to just, I said, you know what, you go ahead and set them and if I don't like them, I can just change them later, and I can. That's really nice. Um, and also, um, when you run a report, and it took me a while to catch on to this, you're gonna get a, a more simplified view, and then you can work down into the intricacy by clicking, you'll start with like a summary, and then if you wanna get in deeper and see the actual titles, you can keep clicking, and it'll make it more. And so you can, you can choose. Do I want a quick view, or do I wanna get down to the nitty gritty? So that's what I like. 
Yeah, you mentioned targets. So one of the things that software does is you can basically set up these parameters, such as you know, if it hasn't served in three years, but then apply it to different parts of your collection. So for us, this was particularly useful with the nonfiction where we used, we set different parameters based on the call number ranges. So, you know, philosophy, okay, the book is maybe 15 years old, but still relevant because Plato was still relevant to philosophy, whereas in computer science, a book that's three years old and hasn't checked out in three years is really irrelevant at this point. So we're able to kind of, we use the crew manual to sort of set up our various parameters for our nonfiction collection. And then, then we can just run the report. We don't have to, every time we run a report, like you do with Ryzen, remember what you had and what those, those targets were. So it's very useful in that you can just sort of preset these parameters and then just spit off a report once you've got that set up. The other area in which it's been really useful for us is there's a piece that what Inkville didn't dem demonstrate, and that's um, you can basically go through all libraries in the United States and maybe even the world, but um, that have Collection HQ and what their circulation is for certain titles. So you can basically go in and look at um, your one. You can go to the nonfiction section and look at the 100s in the Dewey range and see the most circulating 100s in libraries across the nation. And to me, that's very useful because while I can usually discover James Patterson, I know that's going to be popular. Top circulating versus top purchasing is, is a different metric, and particularly in the nonfiction, I think that's very important. So to us, when we did some of the weeding in the nonfiction, we used the selection piece to discover titles in those areas of collection, and then we developed the nonfiction based on those criteria. I like the flexibility of it as well in that I can just target small collections. Um, we have our paperbacks divided by genre, so I can just zero in on that one day and take care of it in parenting collection. There's also a feature in here which I haven't been able to get to work, and I just haven't contacted you, of um, actually setting up a calendar. Mm -hmm. So it keeps track of what you've done when mm -hmm. and the type of things because I'm not as so organized that I have it on an Excel sheet or on my calendar. It's like this month it's time to do this or that or the other thing. And I can see that being very useful for ongoing. And I agree with them about what they've found. Uh, like I said, if, if we, uh, we need to start using it more for the acquisitions and building the collection again, but I don't know if I've weeded enough all the way through either. All right, then the flip side of that, of course, is what drawbacks have you found for Collection HQ? Well, it's, it's a pain that, it, that the updates are only once a month. I've complained about that because mm -hmm. I want to run my report now when I'm ready to do it, and I want to have the most up-to-date information. So you have to think about when you got your last data set and take that into account when you run it. Um, like I said, it can be difficult to decide what to make as your beginning targets. Um, especially, I just I just didn't have the time to sit and think through all that. And um, but if you know Ingvild can give you a starting base, I did feel confident that in the future, as I ran reports, well, this is not giving me quite what I want. That I could always go in and and tweak that. Um, and then just part of the learning curve thing, sometimes it can be difficult. You know there's so much in there is to figure out actually where to go. <laughs> okay, I want to find this, what, you know, and to learn the lingo. But I think, I think that you wrote up a nice little summary once of what the different reports did. And, mm -hmm. you know, they have it arranged with those four tabs on top. If you can get a, your brain around, well, they're pretty clear actually. You know at least to where to start and then you get in there. That was that was the cons that I came up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to agree that the the setup on this thing is is just so cumbersome that I believe it would turn a lot of libraries off. Just the amount of time involved. You know, it's great once you've gotten to that point where you can just spit out the reports based on targets you set up, but getting to that point is pretty arduous in my opinion. And it, it's I don't know how it would be any different, but it's just it's time intensive, I guess, is to get to that point. The other thing that I actually, I know you've been doing the Grubby. Mm -hmm. 
I actually found the grubbing not to be very useful for us at all. And I know that that's sort of one of the main features that they promote. But w in practice, I found that sure the going and looking at all these books that come out on the report is it takes a lot of time. In a lot of cases, we, we start pulling the books off. Say, oh, yeah, this is in bad shape. Well, let's go replace it. It's been a popular title over the years. Well, then it's out of print, or you know, you can't find it, and and so it's like I've spent all this time identifying these items, but I can't even replace them. And then once I do, I'm spending money on old materials anyway, and not on new materials. So I kind of feel like it's almost a waste of of spending at that point. So mm -hmm. it was. I ended up just sit, just stopping doing our grubby altogether. But that was just my own personal experience with it. So. I found the same thing. Yeah. Well, we don't necessarily replace them, but at least we we've got the more shelf room because of it and, yeah and uh, or maybe it's just a subject area that if it's getting that heavily used but it's 15 years old okay I mean pa patrons as we know do, don't look at publication dates when you see what comes in on ILL <laughs> but um, sure. you know so we're protecting them <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the I think I mentioned drawbacks once again, um, if you do something at the beginning of the month and withdraw things like um, and whatever, it's not going to be interactive immediately. So that is, a, you know, it's not all the time you have to plan for it. But we are so used to Horizon being there immediately that that's one thing you do have to um, take into consideration. And. Um, I think that's all I have to add besides what they've said. Okay, do you have any final comments or last words on Collection HQ? Well, in uh, one of the, the webinars I watched yesterday, you know, they, they just to give you the right mindset when you look at this, it's, it's, this is a process. You're not ever going to be done with this. It's to help you improve your collection, to respond to your patrons, um, and your patron's needs are going to change, so you know you might have worked really hard to get here, and oh, now it's all different. So it's just, it's an ongoing thing. You're not ever going to be done. Um, and I, I just think it's, oh, and there's a part that I haven't got in, gotten into yet, but where it helps you decide how much you should spend on different mm -hmm. parts of your collection, mm -hmm. which I think would be really interesting to see mm -hmm. um, once you... So it, it's really a tool, like it says, to help you um, manage your collection and meet your patrons' needs as they change. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great tool. It's very powerful, but unless you're a full-time collection development librarian, you know, what, how much time can you really devote to the software? And I think that's where we've seen a lot of lack of effort, not because it's not useful, but because of the time involved and you know weighing the time you can spend on this versus time you could be spending on other tasks at your job so I would use it but I think we're gonna get rid of it right so I don't know if you're allowed to talk about that or not but <laughs> <laughs> Oops. It's, it's uncertain right now okay well I mean I would yeah I would love it if we could keep it but it is rather expensive and since it was grant funded this go around, it does have a big price tag. And um, budgets are always an issue. So right now, the future's uncertain. Future's uncertain. A lot of that is because Selco's budget is uncertain right now. There's, the legislature hasn't decided anything. So. Which it is every year. Yeah. Yep. So. For us, we, we did start it before it became a Selco grant, and um, one staff member is more adamant about this, and so we were trying it. And um, you do need, as James said, it is very intense, and I, I keep thinking through it. If I were a one-person library, and we're medium-sized with more people, but at the same time, I do uh, the weeding, but I'm very smaller part involved with the development part. So if that's not being taken over or um, there's some lapses, 
because of that too and I can recommend but it's not always my pushing the button to get the order in and right away so um, and if you're one person you're you're uh, <laughs> doing everything else um, it is such a powerful tool that it does take so, a lot of time to use so it's like anything there's the, the positives are great but I'm not sure it's for everyone and I don't know if the cost can justify that either for either individual libraries or the whole region. So. Does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah. What are the main things that it can do that our existing reporting just can't do? Some of the things like the leading reports sound similar. The, the in terms of just collection development, being able to look at the top circulating titles at other libraries is a huge factor. The being able to get just a summary report of areas in which you're over circulated, under circulated, yeah, you could probably spend many hours coming up with an Excel formula for all that, but it would be beyond even my capability. I think most people's really, unless you're a statistician, so the software does that automatically. Um, being able to just have preset parameters rather than having to keep track of it manually. So it's not that you can't necessarily do some of those things, but it's impractical to do it really with Horizon other than maybe just straight up weeding report. Right, I did do actually comparison when I was first starting this. I, I would run it in the web reporter and I would run it here there were very little differences and sometimes it was because I didn't know also if I wasn't manipulating this data to match that because at times I thought I could do better with web reporter because I had more experience with it so um, there's that too you know it, uh, it, it just depends on how how much you want to get into this and really spend become a collection development person Do you know if it tracks, particularly in the collection and development side of things, does it track the things that your patrons are requesting that you don't have? Like, does that... In your library phone? Like if your patrons are requesting a button by a certain author or a certain subject and you don't, they have to request it because you don't have it. To some extent. Um, that's another drawback that I found for Collection HQ. It's really set up for a central system with branches, mm -hmm. and the way we mm -hmm. run our ILL really confuses it. So sometimes you will come on your top author list and hear something popular, but you have zero items. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always happen that way. Okay, unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but we all get free boxes from Collection HQ with t-shirts and pens and other goodies there. In the hallway, everyone gets a t-shirt. Two. Yeah. Or two. I don't know what else. Excellent. They look like this. They're, they're, they're something you will exciting. want to wear all the time. <laughs> all right, thank you. I don't you. know who wouldn't want to wear one of these.